Hello to you. Thanks very much for finding the time to talk to us today. Thank you very much. Now, Sweden joined NATO in March of this year. That was after decades of neutrality. So just explain to us, first of all, why Sweden joined now. Well, Sweden joined because of uh, Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, and that led both Sweden and Finland to reach the decision that uh, it was only by uh, joining NATO and uh, being given the protection under Article 5 one for all, all for the many, but we will be, will be able to protect our populations. It's also clear that Russia, just before the war in December, sent a letter to the world by Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov saying that Sweden and Finland would never be allowed to join NATO. So we already knew where Russia was on this particular issue. But as you can all see, this was a major defeat already for Russia, that Sweden and Finland has joined and that Sweden has given up uh, a history of two hundred years of being a non-military aligned nation. And this is as a consequence of this war and the ruthlessness which uh, Russia pursues this war against Ukraine and its population. And as you've spelt out, you joined NATO in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Presumably then you do understand why it is so important for Ukraine itself to join the alliance. How close is Ukraine to being admitted into the NATO fold? Indeed, it is very important, of course, for Ukraine to be allowed to walk the path towards becoming a full member of NATO and also for EU, because these two processes are slightly interconnected, because what Ukraine now performs in reforms of its uh, constitution, its law, laws against corruption, etc., will also, of course, play into the, the thing about becoming a NATO, NATO member. And we see progress, even under these very difficult circumstances with the war ongoing uh, against Ukraine uh, because of Russia's illegal aggression, we can see that Ukraine performs. I'm not going to set a specific date, but I would like to point to the fact that the summit here in Washington is now following up on last year's summit in Vilnius in Lithuania and the word irrevocable, the irrevocable path for Ukraine uh, towards NATO membership is now in the conclusions of the summit and this is something which Sweden is very very much in favour of. Uh, this is Robert Parsons, Chief Foreign Editor at France 24. Given what you've just said uh, and the pressure on Ukraine coming from Russia, what more precisely can be done at the moment to, to help the Ukrainians achieve the goal, ultimately, uh, of victory uh, against Russia? Well, one very important thing also coming out of the summit here in, in D.C. of NATO is the decision to see to it that NATO will now take over the coordination of the support for Ukraine from the U.S. and other member states. It will be a coordinating organization. And this is very beneficial for the long-term support by NATO allies towards Ukraine. Let's, let us not forget that 99% of all military support to Ukraine has come from NATO, NATO allies. Uh, with this coordination mechanism, it will be possible to increase the production of defense material given to Ukraine. And this is something which Europe has to do, because Europe has to understand that we have also a greater responsibility than other states to uh, see to it that Ukraine receives defense material, not only to defend itself, but also to re retake uh, the offensive and ultimately win decisive military victories in the battlefield, which is the only thing which is going to make Russia alter its, its course and its, its goals. Uh, re the re-establishment of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine is paramount, and this is ultimately what this war is all about. You, you say that, but there do seem to, to be divisions within NATO about how to achieve victory and what victory actually means uh, uh, ultimately. Today we had a response from Moscow to the NATO summit. Dmitry uh, Pieskov, the press secretary Vladimir Putin, uh, sa saying that there would have to be a strong response to what NATO uh, had done and said over the last three days. Is there a real danger, do you think, that this war in Ukraine could tip over into a wider conflict between Russia and NATO, and what needs to be done, or how should NATO act, given that that possibility exists in the background? Well, first of all, we have seen a lot of saber rattling from Russia over the, the years since since Russia launched its full-scale invasion of, of uh, uh, against Ukraine, and even prior to that. So I don't think that we should take those threats very seriously. The ultimate thing to understand is that Russia 
only believes in one thing, and that is power and military power above all, all else. And helping Ukraine to regain the initiative by helping out militarily, humanitarian, financial and political is Sweden's first and foremost political priority. There is nothing more important for us in foreign policy than aiding Ukraine. And we are going to act along those lines also as a NATO ally and as a member of the EU, because the security concerns us greatly uh, in all these organizations, what's going on, the outcome of, of uh, Russia's illegal aggression against Ukraine. And helping Ukraine, as I said, is a long-term commitment. It has to go on regardless of elections in the US and regardless of, of how we view um, uh, Russia's machinations with, with China, Iran, and North Korea, who are ganging up as authoritarian states. And China wishes, of course, to see uh, Russia win in Ukraine, because that will mean of the, that the whistle blows for its ambitions in the Indo-Pacific. So the security of the Euro-Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific is now closely interconnected. I would say that they are almost two sides of the same coin. And we have to realize this, and we have also to understand that if we want US to remain committed to what's going on in Europe and the war in Ukraine, we NATO allies and the EU has to show interest and commitment to what's going on in the Indo-Pacific. That doesn't mean military support, it's a question about political support and the understanding that the four IP nations, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, who are represented here in, at, the, at the, the summit here in Washington with NATO as partners, but they have great concerns mm. over the assertiveness of China. And we have to weigh this in in our strategies. I want to come back to China in a moment, sir, but first you mentioned elections and I just want to get clarity from you on whether you and your European NATO colleagues are concerned that Donald Trump might win the election in the United States in November and what kind of impact his presence may have on the bloc. I think we, first of all, have to snap out of a misunderstanding, all of us, namely that the discussion of, of US engagement in NATO and support is only about Donald Trump. Uh, what he has been saying, unfortunately, it seems to me we have lost our. Uh, can you hear us there, Foreign Minister? We had some sound issues on our line, but I gather you have reconnected. Do you hear me well? Uh, I hear you very well. All right. Well, go ahead, sir. Answer my question then about Donald Trump, <coughs> what impact his possible win in the United States may have on NATO. Yeah. Well, the important thing to understand is that the United States has, has had over several years and decades throughout many precedents uh, legitimate concerns over the fact that European allies have not spent it enough on defense. Uh, there is a lot of talk, for example, about the 2% target. Sweden is reaching the 2% target already this year and we will remain above the 2% target and we encourage others to do the same and we consider it as a floor and not a ceiling. And I think that this has to be weighed in when we talk about the outcome of a US election. We shouldn't have free riding in, in NATO. Everybody has to live up to their commitments and this is a clear signal we wish to send also to the American people. We understand that you cannot carry the burden of defending Europe alone. We all have to do our part of the work and those NATO allies who have, uh, allies who have not yet reached the 2% goal should speed up and do so. All right, a final question for you then. You mentioned China as well a bit earlier on. NATO has issued a really rather strong statement on China this week at the summit, calling Beijing, and I quote, a decisive enabler of Russia's war in Ukraine. You personally have called on NATO to step up uh, efforts on China. Just spell out for us why and your response then to um, the backlash that we can see that this is already generating in Beijing. Hmm. Well, first of all, we fully back this statement because it is quite clear that China, together with countries like Iran and North Korea, are enablers of Russia's illegal aggression against Ukraine. They are supporting Russia by military means and also by, by political and financial means. And this we have to take into account when we speak about China. There is also China's assertiveness against other states in its neighborhood. I'm not only talking about the IP4, Japan, South Korea, Australia and New Zealand, but also other states like the Philippines, like Vietnam and of course also Taiwan, who feel the breath 
of a dragon down their ne neck. And we have to take this into account and understand that the Euro-Atlantic security and the Indo-Pacific security are something which should be a concern to all of us. And we should stand up for values and for rights, regardless of geographies. And NATO membership, as Sweden now has, is also a commitment to a certain a certain uh, row of values. So sending a clear signal to China that we see what you do, we see that you support Russia, and this is something which we will weigh in when we deal with you. This is very important, and it is an important outcome of the summit here in DC that this signal, this clear message is being sent to Beijing. Great to talk to you, sir. Thank you very much indeed for your time. That's uh, Sweden's Foreign Minister Tobias Bellström speaking to me and Rob Parsons here on the programme.